Funding for this edition of Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been provided by PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. RWJ Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, here when you need us most, now and always. Prudential Financial, New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT, makes industry-ready professionals in all STEM fields. And by the Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe. And by New Jersey Monthly the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Hi everyone, Steve Adubato. This is Remember Them. That is Jackie Chicarico, our executive producer and my co-host Jackie. Today we're going to take a look at someone I knew really well. He passed away a couple of years ago. My dad, Steve Adubato Sr. We have a bunch of people that are going to be talking about him in the next half hour. Uh, Senator Cory Booker, Jim McGreevy, uh, Assemblywoman Ileana Pinter-Marin, Pinter whole range of other people. My sister Michelle, who runs the North Ward Center that my dad ran for so many years, established it in 1970. Hey, this is a Remember Them that is uh, really personal for me. Yeah, really special for you and special for all of us. I mean, I had the opportunity to meet your dad on several different occasions. And I know that he has really shaped so much of who you are today. Um, and I just know this is such a special way to celebrate his life, uh, to take this opportunity um, after his passing to be able to really pay tribute to him and celebrate his life. And Steve, for you, what has been some of the biggest lessons that you've taken from your dad that you carry with you still today? You know, it's so interesting. My dad accomplished great things, uh, established the Robert Street Academy Charter School, one of the first charter schools in the country, very successful. The North Ward Center, a community-based organization established in 1970 that my sister, Michelle, runs right now. Um, very involved in political affairs behind the scenes. Never wanted to run for office, Jackie. He always said, I'll be behind the scenes. I used to say, Dad, you don't want to put your name on a ballot. You don't know if people are going to vote for you. And he was tough. He was rough and he was gruff, but he also had a big heart. And I used to see him around the kids at the Robert Treat Academy. Um, my sisters, my two sisters, Michelle and Teresa, would often say this, that he had this big soft spot for those kids in Newark at the Robert Treat Academy Charter School. And it, we had never really, we didn't see that side of him. He was really very different with other people's kids, particularly um, African-American, Latino kids in the North Ward of Newark where he did his work. He had a real soft spot for them. He cared for them deeply. And, and that's why his impact and his legacy in Newark will live on for so long, Steve. I mean, what he has, what he had contributed to Newark, to the children of Newark, to so many people's lives that he has touched throughout the years, being a resident in Newark and staying in New York, Newark for so long. Uh, and, you know, we'll hear from some of those people whose careers that he's touched, but also the, the lives that he's touched personally on such a personal level. You know, some of the people in the documentary will talk about the first time they met my dad or a meeting they had with my dad. And he was a, he was a character. He was his favorite expression, Jackie, was this. If you were he thought you were distracted for half a second. Listen to me. L you, you listening to me? And then he would tell you something he thought was incredibly profound. He also had this big picture, frame picture of Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, you may ask, what? Why? And he was obsessed with Machiavelli, a figure from uh, the 16th century in Italy, who he tried to emulate. And Machiavelli was this great leader, scholar, but he could be very rough and very shrewd. My dad was like, yeah, I'm the Machiavelli of our times. And so it was so interesting. So while people talk about him that way, as a character who could be tough and gruff, as I said, he did these extraordinary things. He was a complex man. And, you know, and he's really a 
Go, I'm sorry, Jack. And being a, a an amazing leader definitely was one of his strongest suits, I think. But what do you think he would want us to say was the biggest <laughs> legacy that he left behind? You know, this is going to sound nuts, but it's true. And my mom, who's watching, knows this is true. He he said, when I die, um, I want on my tombstone. Here lies Steve Adubato Sr. He was not a nice guy. And I was like, Dad, what do you mean? And he goes, listen. Nice guys, they're not the people who change the world. It's people like me who sometimes could be nasty and mean, but they get things done. I said, Dad, isn't there some happy medium? I think as he got older, he started to realize that there may have been <laughs> happy medium, but I don't think he ever found it. So listen, I think his legacy is about those kids in Newark, many of whom will never know him. He didn't know them, but um, their lives are better because of his work. So to honor my dad, Jackie, who met him a few times and... I've had more than a few difficult conversations with him over the years. Uh, my late uh, great dad, Steve Adubato Sr. This is uh, Remember Them, Steve Sr. We are joined here at New Jersey Performing Arts Center uh, by a gentleman I've been looking to interview. He's been ducking me for about 15 years. Finally, he's here. I got him on camera. Steve Adubato Sr., the founder and executive director of the North Ward Center, one of the country's most respected and successful nonprofit organizations. You leave the public schools back in, um, well, 1970, you leave. Yes. After how many years were you teaching, by the way? 16 years. 16 years. I mean, I remember you hated it at a certain point. Not yeah. that you hated the kids, you, you couldn't uh, do it. Because I knew I wasn't, it wasn't happening. Okay. 32 years later, this is yeah. what you're doing. You, your work and the work of the people around you the teachers, the administrators, the staff, has been recognized nationally. Yes. You interact with these kids a lot. I've seen you. Yes. What's it like for you to be in a classroom with these kids in the Robert Treat Academy, the other um, programs? What's it like to actually be in a classroom you know, with those like kids? It's like a grandparent. You know how a grandparent feels? Everything is great with the kids. That's the way it feels. It's fantasy, pure fantasy. The kids know Big Steve. That's what they call you. I, you know what I'm proud of? I don't... You know, I'm a really proud man, you know, very, very proud. I'm proud that I don't know if there's anybody my age, I'm 69, you know, and an executive who knows as many children as I do, know who they are, they know who I am. That makes me, that's great. Cory Booker has to go vote, Senator Booker has to vote, but he wanted to say something about Steve Sr. Go ahead. I have never met a human being like him. He is one of the most... In fact, I was doing something early in my career as a city council person, living in a mobile home, parking on the toughest drug corners. 60 minutes, Dan Rather came to Newark to, to, to do a story about me. Very few people were afraid at that time to talk to Dan Rather. Your dad's like, come on up. He, I, he disappears, Dan Rather, for hours and hours. He comes back to me and says, kid, you're an interesting story, but the most interesting story we've heard in American politics is this guy we just met, Steve Adubato. And that was your dad, larger than life character, straight out of Hollywood couldn't make somebody up like him. And the best thing about him, though, with all his bombacity, with all of and his... some foibles, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, I will go into the foibles if you want. But for no, me, no, what no, I always said is, Steve, thing. I always said, Steve, you have my love. Steve Sr., you have my love because I see what you are doing for children and for seniors up here. It's unparalleled levels of success you're getting for the well-being of our children and of our elders. It's one of those guys that, where I always say, don't listen to what he says as much as you look at what he does. In those days, we had all kinds of ideas about black and white, which are absurd. As a matter of fact, people thought that because we had a black mayor, that there was something, uh, let's say, strange and wrong because it didn't exist, something new. We were ready to accept it, but the people were not ready to accept that. So we caught a lot of hell. We were not popular in our community. We were extremely controversial because we not only accepted this new leadership, we supported it. But that made us tough. That made us strong. It made us understand that doing the right thing is the thing that would make us happy. All right, remember them. Steve Adubato Sr. The question is to Michelle Adubato, who runs the North Ward Center that our dad founded in 1970. Why is it important for our audience to remember Steve Sr.? I mean, his impact in New Jersey and on education is really he was in the forefront 
of education. Um, his impact is lasting on and goes on in terms of what he's done for the city of Newark, um, the programs, the people that he's affected, thousands of people um, because of the opportunities that he gave uh, in terms of the services to the North Ward Center and so much more than that, his impact politically. What do you think he taught us, me, you, our sister Teresa, of all the faults that we have, uh, he had many as well, mostly on the personal side, you know? Uh, it was not the easiest, fair, fair to say, not the easiest of dads? No, not, not the easiest, that's for sure. But the what? Um, it all depends on your definition of what a dad should do, right? What do they teach us? So if you think that your dad should be like, you know, making sure that you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> that was not, Sorry. that was not in his playbook. He made sure that we understood the world around us. No matter how ugly it could get, he never shielded us. He wanted us to see the world and people as they are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we did. Um, some would argue that that was a little too much at the ages that we saw it. Um, my feeling is it has certainly made us better people in terms of understanding how to deal with situations right then, right there, and to keep on going. And, you know, for that, I'm internally, you know, grateful for that. Yeah. He had a unique leadership style, did he not? He sure did. You know, he was no holes barred. Um, he told you his version of the truth. Um, he didn't um, edit his words. And uh, that hurts sometimes, but honestly, you know, you know, we could sit and talk about, you know, critically, he was a, a very tough man to be around, um, but I miss him. And, you know, what I miss is, is what would he be doing right now? Like, I wonder with this pandemic, how would he have handled it? He was pretty good in a crisis when the fire happened at the North Ward Center yeah. in the middle of the night. I believe it was the night after Christmas, 1970. I'll get the date wrong. Uh, I think it's 76. Mom will correct us when she sees this. But, but he was right there. The, the building, the North Ward Center was burning down to the ground. And he, not a, not a tear shed, he told everybody, you can go ahead and cry right now, but tomorrow morning we're going to be back here to rebuild. Remember that? I mean, 100%. you were a little kid. You don't even remember, do you? Let me tell you. Um, and I'm sure you get the same way when there's a real crisis. And I could say, certainly we use this as a, you know, the pandemic was a serious crisis, is a serious crisis. In many ways, I did the same thing. I put my, I kept my head, you know, up in terms of what we needed to do there. Believe it or not, little or no emotion. This is what we need to do. This is what needs to happen. And we're going to keep, we're going to stay the course. And, um, you know, so those kind of, I guess experiences has truly taught me how to be a leader in, in all situations, especially a leader in the most difficult situations. Think of a life of a human being like a athletic contest, like a race. And everyone is at the starting line together. And I'm thinking about our kids in Newark, Camden, Trenton, cities all over the country starting line right let's say the starting line is being born but because of the disadvantages of being in urban america the child stumbles and he falls and the other kids are running so they have a big head start and you know what you can never catch up you, you might try harder but you never catch up we're going to give our children a great start equal, if not superior, than people who live in more affluent com uh, communities. And we're doing that every day here. To see more Remember Them programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Dr. Sharif El Nahal. Did you know that there are nearly 4,000 New Jerseyans waiting for a life-saving transplant? And 67% of those people are people of color. 
Just one organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. Let's come together to raise awareness in our diverse communities. Donation needs diversity. You have the power to make a difference. For more information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org. There he is, former governor, always a governor once you're a governor, Jim McGreevy. Hey, Jim, let me ask you. I got to ask you about my dad. What do you remember about Steve Sr.? Oh, my God. <laughs> so I've got so many Steve Adubato stories. It's actually frustrating. I just the first time. So the first time, you know, you go up and Steve Adubato is, is a legend. And you're in the North Ward Cultural Center. And I happen to have been born with the handicap of being Irish going to the North Ward Cultural Center. So all things Italian. I mean, I, I, I could have virtually been in Rome. Especially the food. Oh, you know, but I mean, the, the, you know, you go from room to room to room and you go from Mario Lanza to Pavarotti and you're listening to Italian opera. And so I finally get into, into the room of the Cardinal. The and back room. To, the room the in the back. Room. Right. And he and he says to me, he looks up and they're piping in La Boheme. And he said, he looks up and he goes, a lot better than Irish step dancing. And I, you know, like, what do I do? <laughs> you know, I just like, or I think it was even more cryptic. He said, it's better than Danny Boy. And I'm just like, you know, like, what am I going to do? Everything I, was a con. Why was everything a contest with Steve Sr.? It, it was. And it was particularly a contest between the Irish and Italians because that was the framework of that generation. I mean, they were the two greatest blocks. But the other one, I remember I get elected governor. And I go up to the North Ward Cultural Center. And, and so I, I see all these well scrubbed and, you know, the, the academy is doing so well. The standardized Street test academy. scores are yeah. off, off the charts on mathematics, on language arts. But they're one of the best performing urban schools, not just in Newark, literally in the nation. Kids whose academic growth is tremendous. And I see these well scrubbed kids and I get this warm feeling of, of affection and support. And Steve goes, now. And all these kids hold up these signs and say, show me the money. Show me the money. And I'm like, like, like Steve. <laughs> it was just are you, hold on one second. Jim McGreevy, are you saying when you were the governor, my father used those kids to try to put pressure on you to get more state money for his programs with those kids at the Robert Trudy camp? Are you implying that or stating exactly. it? Exactly. Blatantly and shamelessly, show me the money. And so the, the, the point was, all right, McGreevy, you can come up here and talk and hawk about how great their standardized test scores are. But at the end of the day, I've got to produce, I've got to hire good teachers. He had a longer, he had a longer classroom instructional period. And he also taught, I mean, he, he wasn't a great believer in summers off. I mean, the, all children were in that school for at least three fifths of the summer period. And so his point was, yes, these, these results happen, but they don't happen because of the Holy Ghost. They happen because we're teaching longer, we're teaching harder, and we're making sure that we provide these benefits. Why is it that the Robert Treat Charter School yes. has these kids succeeding, performing like a grade above in reading and math tests, and the kids, their counterparts in the mm. public schools are suffering? What's that about? It's that we are not buried under bureaucracy. Uh, we can have, we can s stick to the simple task of educating children. Say somebody else says, I want to do what you're doing, Steve, out about it. I want to start a charter school in my city. It could be in Baltimore, Philadelphia, or audience in urban areas all, all right, over. Number one, what, do they want to, what do they need to do? Number one, have much higher expectations. In other words, our school opens at 7.30 in the morning, closes at 5.30 at night. It's open 11 months a year. And I said, now Saturday classes. First challenge, make uh, a, a, create a situation where the kids are challenged, where they have to inwardly use their resources and really put, put out work. The answer to America is not charter schools. This, yes, charter schools are not going to, we are a proving ground, a laboratory. The answer is the public schools of America. Can they do it? They, we have to. 90% of our kids in America go to public schools. If our urban schools fail, the price is beyond, if you want to put it in dollars, it's, what is the, price? it's the loss of our future. It means the deterioration of our society.
We're joined by State Assemblywoman from the City of Newark, from the Ironbound section of the City of Newark, State Assemblywoman Ileana Pinter Marin. Good to see you, Assemblywoman. Thanks for having me, Steve. Nice to see you as well. So let me ask you this. I say Steve Adubato Sr., you say? Interesting. <laughs> Come on, you got to give me more than that. What might have interesting? I might not be able to say much. No. Um, Phenomenal leader, um, way, way above and beyond thinking of where he was in that particular time. He is from the North Ward of Newark. You're from the Ironbound section. It, it, without going into the political intrigue involved, because he, in addition to being the leader of the, and the founder of the North Ward Center in Newark, uh, somewhat involved, let's say, in, in, in politics in the state. <clears throat> Did he come to you? I mean, there are other people in between, but I know that he always s talked about you as a very talented young leader who had great potential. It was interesting when I had the opportunity to run for the Board of Ed, right? We've always had, uh, and this is long, even before I came into play, just, um, I want to say like a team, really the North and the East, just because we're very similar, right? We, um, a lot of immigrant families, um, not just now in the East Ward at, at that time, but also in the North Ward, right? When they saw the, from the Italians to the Puerto Rican exchange, the same thing happened in the Ironbound, right? From the Italians to the Portuguese exchange. So there's just been so many similarities. And when I had that opportunity to run, it was gonna be on Steve Adubato's ticket. Um, and it was interesting. I learned a lot that first election. I had no idea what I was really getting myself into. Um, but it was probably one of the most amazing things um, that, I, that I've ever done and been a part of. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> My dad's commitment, uh, and so many other people have talked about this, including the former mayor, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Booker, U.S. Senator, former mayor, and, and, and others, his commitment to the city of Newark. Talk about that, and its children in particular. Yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, people can say whatever they want to say about, you know, uh, Steve's dabbling in politics. But there was one thing that was always clear, that if you were going to be part of uh, of the team, um, it was always putting kids first. And he was such an artist in the sense of being able to craft what he needed politically in order to bring it forward to what he needed for the kids. And I think that sometimes it got lost in translation. But when you see the work and you take a step back, um, you know, between the school, the services and everything, there was really no one like him. He was such a visionary at that time. The biggest achievement, I'm, I'm absolutely sure of this, it's an example that says it can be done. Robert Treat, whatever happens to the children, wonderful. People could come to Robert Treat and see what's going on, and they could duplicate it and do it even better. The most important Robert Treat, it exists, it works, and it says loud and clear, urban children can be prepared for the future. It can be done. Talking about Steve Adubato Sr. with someone who knew him really well, Father Edwin Leahy, the headmaster at St. Benedict's Prep. All right, look, Father Ed, a million stories about Steve Sr. We don't have time for all that. Why do people need to remember Steve Adubato Sr.? Don't hold back. <laughs> uh, well, because of what Steve did in the community. Right? I mean, he, he never left. He lived in Newark uh, all his life, intentionally. And uh, people should know about him because of his organizational ability and that, uh, that he wasn't embarrassed uh, by politics. I used to ask him all the time, Steve, why do you do this? He said, well, some people study med go to school to study medicine. Some people go to school to study to be lawyers. He said, I, went I studied politics, so I practice politics. And he was unabashed about it and helped a whole lot of people as a result of it. I mean, they, you know, all you have to do is look at the center and the schools and uh, how many uh, young people have been helped? How many seniors have been helped by him? Uh, you need to know about him so other people behind him can do the same kind of things. But you, you and I have had so many uh, conversations offline about him, about family. And, and uh, you told me so many times that my dad would stop by St. Benedict's into the Abbey and just sit, you know, did, pick up from there, pick up from there, Father. Yeah, he, he, there were times I'd go to church early in the morning uh, and we, we have prayer together in the monastery at six. And I'd walk into church before six and he'd already be there. He'd be sitting in the monk's choir. And uh, 
tell the the the, the security guy at the front desk to get, let him in. He'd get in. He'd, he'd sit there. And there are other nights where we'd be in the middle of, or in the early part, not always, sometimes in the middle of dinner. And at dinner, we uh, we eat in silence and we have we read, a, a, somebody takes turns reading each week from a, a, a book that we all listen to. And uh, he would walk in. And now there, there could be uh, maybe 10, 12 empty chairs at the various tables in the dining room, the refectory. He'd walk in and sit at the Abbott's table, which... Which, if you knew Steve, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be surprised at that. But some people might be. He would go in, sit himself there, and um, it was just like home for him. And then he would tell me that uh, I uh, I was I, I wanted to be a priest, but I he said I couldn't be obedient, so that's why he didn't do it. You guys were tight personally. Not a lot of people not a lot of people were tight with him personally. Yeah, we spent a lot of time together. We spent I mean he'd show up here or he'd call me and say, get up here, right? Come up right now. Um and we just spent a lot of time together and driving around at night. Um it was interesting to me because the things there was and you see this, I've seen it before in other um super bright people. Who there was a childlikeness in your father that was, uh, if you spent a lot of time with him, you'd say he would go around and, and look at, uh, at various signs and different things, some of which had him on them, no doubt. But uh, uh, it fascinated him, these things, which is why he could walk into a kindergarten class or a first grade class and, and be completely immersed with those little kids. And they loved him, right? Yeah, he was like every, at that point in his life, he was like everybody's grandfather. Uh, with the kids. I talked about uh, dreams, you know, come true. But what happens if what happens is even bigger than a dream? That's my story. That's why in the morning, I can't wait to get here and to be part of this. To be part of a dream even bigger than that. Wow. Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSCNG, NJM Insurance Group, RWJ Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Prudential Financial, New Jersey Institute of Technology, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and by New Jersey Monthly. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Hey, Flamingo Insurance, what do you want? Um... Yeah, can we get the auto insurance policy? Anything else? Um, can we add an extra driver? Number four combo, your premium comes with pick up spot two. Okay. When it comes to insurance, you don't have to sacrifice service to save. Wait, this isn't even the right policy. Upgrade to NJM and get the five-star customer service you deserve with discounts you'll love. Excuse me, Mr. Rollerbird? No jingles or mascots, just great insurance. NJM, get a quote today. PSENG is building the utility of the future. A future where people use less energy and it's cleaner, safer, and delivered more reliably than ever. 
We are modernizing to lower emissions, support more renewables and electric vehicles, and reduce outages. And we are empowering our customers. At PSE&G, we are powering progress.